What I enjoy most about our practice is restoring a person's smile. That often changes their personality and gives them a more positive outlook on life. Our practice uses the most modern dental technology from rotary endodontics, computer-generated ceramic restorations, digital radiographs, intraoral photography, and of course, we use nitrous oxide and oral sedation for the highest level of patient comfort and relaxation. My name is Dr. Charlie Adelson, and I am a periodontist, owner, and co-partner with my father, Dr. Harvey Adelson, who's a cosmetic dentist. What I love about what I do is being able to restore people's smiles and change the way they chew, change the way they live, and change their self-esteem and how they think about themselves on a daily basis. When a patient comes to my office, they're being treated like family. And it's also being a team approach where the hygienist, the cosmetic dentist, and the periodontist are all working together to give them the optimal result. My name is Jennifer Cacciola. I've been coming here for about 10 years. My experiences have been very positive. The staff is very professional. I came here 10 years ago to get my veneers put on, and I have been absolutely thrilled with the results. And I can't say how wonderful and professional um, the staff has just been. They've been really, really caring and just amazing. I would definitely recommend this place to others. I have actually recommended for people to come here. My husband has come here as well. My name is Clint Stevenson. I've been coming to Dr. Adelson's office for about five and a half years now. They've been phenomenal. I'm never a big fan of the dentist, but ever since I got introduced to this office, great staff, very friendly, and um, I always feel like I'm taken care of well. Very professional. Every time I come here, I feel like I get the full most uh, from their attention from the staff and Dr. Adelson and himself as well. So it's a great experience every time I come. I look forward to it as well. I highly recommend them. You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Okay, how is everybody? Happy Thursday. Very excited to show you this cross, the cross that we were into last night when we so rudely got interrupted. The deep dive true crime mentor lawyer made it private about 15 minutes before we were done with it. So I thought I'd start from the beginning. And so some of it may be a review and really get into it because it is too delicious to be sandwiched into a three and a half hour episode and <laughs> near the end. And there are some things I'm going to clarify, but before I do, just want to get into your comments and Thank you so much, Yakira Arias, for your very early and very appreciated super chat. Okay, so let us, always the most fantastic comments. Michelle Langdon, 5134, says, Wendy uses different word choices because she wants to appear smarter than Georgia and everyone else. Wendy, do you need to pee after drinking a lot of water? Do I need to urinate after drinking a lot of water? Wendy would say, yes. She'll stop doing that once she's locked up. Oops, incarcerated. <laughs> Funny comment, Michelle. 
And it's something her brother Charlie does too. So when he was asked, did anyone ha un ha hold a gun, excuse me, to your head? He said, no one held a firearm to my head. So it's an odd thing that the Adelson family seems to do reframing questions with their own words in answering them. Jennifer Gray, Wendy, uh, Jennifer Gray, 6722 says, Wendy is something else. There's so much to analyze just within this testimony. Her weird face gestures, her, her word choices, her lack of any emotion is so strange to me. Thank for you for your coverage on this. You bring a lot of things to light that I didn't see before. You're welcome, Jennifer. And yes, it's a lot to take in. Gracie May 899 says, Hi, Roberta. I love your Donna imitations. Thank you. Also, did you notice that when Georgia asked Wendy if she had any knowledge of the plot to kill her ex-husband, Wendy says, no, I did not, but she shakes her head yes. Interesting. Did not notice that. Stuart Lax 1216 says, I think this is a great show. I love not only your voice, but also the logo. Thank you. Thanks for replaying so many perspectives. I think there is lots that none of us in the public know. Sadly, though, I think she will stay free until her mother's trial is concluded. In the closing statements of Charlie's trial, the judge laid out the conditions for conviction. Based on what he stated, I think there is a lot more than enough to convict Wendy. But you have to have a conviction of Donna to really nail down a family conspiracy. If you can do that, then you've got her. When she answered no to the question of would anyone have done this without your permission, and immediately after Charlie, I think, she just told the police it was Charlie who came who came to her, that's where she slipped up. But mom has to get convicted for that to be sold well to a jury. Interesting. That's what I, that's my theory or my working theory is that they're now building this case like a house. So the foundation is built with the shooters all convicted, now the middle woman, then the middle woman, Katie, then Charlie, then Donna, then Wendy. And I don't know about Harvey. He's the big question mark in all of this. But I would have thought that had they had enough evidence to indict Charlie or were ready to indict Harvey, I mean, sorry, Harvey, I think I just said Charlie, I meant Harvey, that they would have arrested Harvey at the airport. They were perfectly happy having Harvey go on a plane to Vietnam. So maybe that shows their hand a little bit. I don't know. What do you think? It would be very hard to extradite him from Vietnam. And of course, we know he didn't go. He was planning on going with his love, his beloved Donna. But... Very interesting that they didn't insist that he not travel. You know, they didn't arrest Harvey and Donna together. They were perfectly happy having him sail away to Vietnam. So I'm going to take a quickie break. When I get back, we're going to go through Wendy Adelson's Amazing cross-examination in Katie McBanawa's retrial. Don't go anywhere. If you are enjoying this episode of my True Crime Report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. 
Thanks so much. Now back to the show. <laughs> My boyfriend's saying that they want a Wendy bobblehead. <laughs> that, is that true? Are you guys talking about that? Tracy Sly, thank you so much for the $10. I've been a court stenographer for 30 years and watch people lie all day. Wendy is such a liar. It's obvious to me. Well, Tracy, I'm so impressed with your skills. I don't know if you know that it's a very special talent being a court stenographer and the dropout rate in school to learn how to be a court reporter is 90 plus. So very few people can do what you do. And you have to listen really, really closely. I know that and be able to be able to type it out. And there's a big shortage here in New York. So of court stenographers. Interesting. So I would think you, yeah, I think you would see a lot of interesting things being a court stenographer. Very, very interesting job. So I'm curious if you think that, Tracy, if you think that you would have been able to pick out Wendy as a liar early on into the investigation, if you were in Craig Islam's, Islam's excuse me, place. Do you think you would have been able to pick that out right away? And if so, what did she do that was that clued her that clued you off to her being a liar? Because I know some of it seems obvious to me the way she composes herself immediately is the thing that impresses me the most when she's just hyperventilating the minute before. But I'm curious to hear what would have tipped you off? Let me know. And just somehow put like a cat emoji if you want it to be read out loud, if you don't mind. I'm curious, so curious what, what you'd say. Interesting. Oh, before we get into the testimony, just one thing that just went up on Murder for Maestro's channel is Wendy Adelson giving a speech, almost a year to the day. So this is after she changed her boy's name. She's so afraid for her life. She's giving this speech about trafficking, promoting her book. And I just want to, and she's wearing the same dress. I just want you to hear this. So I'm going to come back to where I was, but I just want you to see her. She's wearing the same dress, her testimony dress. And it's so boring. I'll spare you. I think it's I think Murder by Maestro entitled it, Wendy Adelson is so boring and only owns one dress. And of course, the intro was for, from Murder by Maestro's channel. So I'm really mining his channel today in this episode with, he found the Adelson Institute, Adelson Institute, excuse me, that advert. And I noticed people have been putting it up all over YouTube now. Stories of pain and of abuse, um, but also stories of tremendous courage, love, uh, humor, and inspiration. So I went to law school. I don't know if any of you are interested in law school, but we can definitely talk about that as well. I went to law school specifically with a plan in mind to become an advocate for immigrants and refugees because it was work that I saw as providing. So there is Wendy talking about law school, but the, there's one interesting part, and I don't know what happened to the cameraman, whether he or she fell asleep or not, but <laughs> so there's no visual to go along with this, but this is the most interesting part of the whole thing is, I'll, it's right around, right around here. Same thing or? Yeah, no, I, I'm actually doing immigration uh, work for families and employers right now. So I'm, I'm doing private immigration work, mainly because of, of a personal family situation. I, I moved to Miami, so I'm now in South Florida instead of Tallahassee. Um, but the funding did dry up for my work and I ended up teaching at the university instead of directly and, and running the clinic for a few years instead of doing this. 
um, the funding dried up. I was funded by the Florida Bar Foundation. So that's interesting that she was funded by the Florida Bar because they also promoted her book. So that was the most interesting part that she called Dan Markell's murder, a personal family situation. And that's why she moved from Tallahassee. It's Miss Lisa. Thank you so much. Uh, Roberta, I heard, I believe on your channel that Harvey has a violent background past. Is this true? If so, what's the tea? Love your show. I wish I still had that. Do I still have that up easily accessible? Not sure if I do, but it was from a tip that he was almost going to go to blows with someone who basically didn't support Charlie and the way that he was basically failing law school. That's my memory of it. Don't quote me on it. And that he was going to go to blows with him. If that's what you're referring to, that may have been on my channel and I'll try to have that for you tomorrow. I know I have it. I just don't have it on the ready as a slide to show you. I have a limited bit of space. I hope that answers your question. So basically he like got up in his face and he was like ready to fight this guy. That's my memory, but of it. And thank you so much. Let me just check here if there's all right. Okay. All right. Let's get into Wendy Adelson's amazing cross where she gets totally, totally demolished. <laughs> Uninterrupted this time. I hope, I hope murder by maestro will not make this private in the middle. <laughs> cross examination. Yes, John. Thank you. Ms. Adelson, this is all about you, isn't it? Excuse me? This. This is all about you, right? Uh, I was called to be a witness and I'm testifying, so I don't understand the question. Is it a question? There's about 100 people in this courtroom, right? There are people in the courtroom. Possibly thousands watching, right? I have no idea who's watching. And it's all because of your failed marriage, right? I disagree with that. You disagree that your ex-husband is dead because of your family? Yes, I disagree. These jurors are here for weeks doing their civic duty because of your marriage, right? No. Katie's going through this, this ordeal because of that marriage, right? No. Dan Markell's parents are going through absolute misery because of your failed marriage. Isn't that right? No, that's incorrect. Well, let's talk about the marriage. You and Professor Markell, you met when you were in law school. You told that to Ms. Kaplan. And it was a whirlwind romance, right? Right? It was not a whirlwind romance, no. It led to a wedding, February 26th of 2006. <laughs> You had a big wedding in Boca Raton, right? Did we get married on February 26, 2006? Is that the question? Yes. In Boca Raton? In Boca Raton, Florida. And it wasn't a small wedding. It was a big wedding. There were many people in attendance. All right. In this marriage, it led to two children, right? Your two boys. Are you asking me if I have two boys? Yes. Yes. And Professor Markell, he was a great father, wasn't he? He was a very good father, yes. Those boys were his world, right? As well as his work, yes. And they adored him too, didn't they? Absolutely. Now, this marriage started to fall apart, right? It did. But there were problems from the very beginning, weren't there? Right? Are you asking me... What is the very beginning? The very beginning of when we got married? Literally at the wedding. There were problems before we got married. All right. So at the wedding, and the, the government asked you about kosher at law, right? About what? I'm sorry? 
keeping kosher. About keeping kosher, yes. Right? And your wedding, at your wedding, was the, the groom's family, the Markel family, and they are more strict than your family and friends about keeping kosher. They do not keep kosher. Wasn't that one of the problems in your marriage that Professor Markell was very insistent about keeping kosher? About his kosher rules, but those are different than his family's. So you're saying that it wasn't a problem at the wedding, that there were people from the groom side of the family that were there that strictly keep kosher, that they were told that it was going to be kosher food, but it actually wasn't. So there was a misunderstanding about whether the food was going to be kosher style or more in adherence with kosher law. There was a miscommunication about that. Okay, this is where I exploded yesterday for those of you who were listening yesterday and said there was no such thing as kosher style, okay? In regards to a big wedding. So someone keeping kosher, it's like you are or you aren't. There is no sort of gray area in regards to a kosher person coming to a wedding and going, oh, I thought it was going to be kosher style. So we know this is a big wedding of look like from the pictures, pretty formal wedding. And there is such a thing as kosher style, but here's what it is. Okay. So I <laughs> just did a little checking and it is absurd. It's still just as absurd. Let me just show you. And Tracy, I want to get to your comments in a second. I haven't forgotten about you. Um, kosher style refers to foods commonly so associated with Jewish cuisine. So, for example, the Carnegie Deli, which was like this famous deli in New York, unfortunately closed, was famous for their pastrami, would have traditional kosher foods mixed in with some non-kosher foods like BLTs, but things that would be kosher style would be, um, was invented by Nathan. So this was invented by the Nathan's famous because Nathan's lacked rabbinical super rabbinic supervision and the meat was not kosher. So they said it was kosher style. So it would remind kosher people. So hot dogs, these are things that would be kosher style, Reuben sandwiches, Mono Crisco sandwiches, cheesecake, creams cheese, nothing that you would have at a formal wedding. Here's some examples. Um, gefilte fish, things that aren't uh, cabbage rolls, egg creams, knishes, chopped liver, borscht. So I don't know if she had any of these things, pastrami. So she would have to, I mean, come on. No one who is kosher would actually be satisfied. In fact, probably would be sadder that they couldn't eat foods that they probably most likely grew up with. So it's just as absurd to say there was a miscommunication. She knew her husband was keeping kosher. And it's just a big in your face kind of thing to him to say that we're going to have kosher style thing. And it was just a giant miscommunication that we had kosher style food at the wedding. Okay, Tracy. So Tracy, I'm going to go a little bit backwards. And to answer your question, I think I could have picked a jury better for way less money. <laughs> I bet you could have. So, I mean, so of course, Tracy's referring to Scott uh, Josh Dubin. Wow, I'm really making the verbal mistakes tonight. So she says, I asked Tracy what she thought as a stenographer would have clued her off to Wendy being a liar. She, and Tracy says here, her body language is so off. Witnesses that lie tend to repeat back the questions and you hit the nail on the head when you talk about how she replaces the name of something with something else. So that's interesting that other people have done that too, because both Wendy and Charlie do that. And thank you, kosher schmosher, right? So look for my kosher style t-shirts coming soon. Totally ridiculous, a total ridiculous lie. And thank you very much, Veronica, 
Sawyer for your super chat. I appreciate it so much. Back to this ridiculous cross, but I just wanted to clarify that there's such a thing exists, but not in the way that Wendy is presenting it here. It's, it's just as ridiculous. So you had people that strictly keep kosher eating non-kosher food, which is a big deal. That actually is not what happened. You had, Danny was upset that it was kosher style and not strictly adhering to kosher law. So, so the, he was disappointed. So there's problems right from the beginning. That was a problem at our wedding, yeah. Fast forward now to September 10th, 2012. Professor Markell, he... So the point of what Wendy's doing is she's trying to make it look like a miscommunication, not a actual middle finger, which I think it was like, this is war. We're going to have things our way, the Adelson way or the highway. And you better start basically bending to our, bending to our will, Dan Markell. And he wasn't easily pushed around is my impression. So she's going to make it look like it's Dan Markell's fault for not understanding that it was kosher style. Like they were having Rubens and bagels and gefilte fish <laughs> and matzo ball soup. And it wasn't really kosher, but it was kosher style. So she was honoring him or including him in some way. Give me a break. And you know what it would be akin to? It would be akin to saying we had food that was vegetarian style, only that there was meat in it, except there, there was beef in it. Sorry, vegetarians. It's vegetarian style. There's a lot of vegetables in it. That would be the, I know I'm a little obsessed, but it's just such a huge lie and ridiculous and something that Wendy knows that the people of Tallahassee might not be all that familiar with most of the people on the jury. He's away on a business trip, right? Yeah. He's in New York City at New York University, right? I believe so, yeah. And he's doing a presentation. I, I don't know what he was doing. Your husband at the time was in New York to give a presentation. You knew that, right? I knew he was in New York. I didn't know if he was attending a conference or giving a presentation, but he was in New York for work. Now, you had not communicated with him for two days. I really don't remember. You text him at around 2.30 in the afternoon, right? Right before he's about to do the presentation. I really don't remember. But you do remember dropping the bomb on him, don't you? Telling him that you wanted a divorce. So I did not drop a bomb on him. We'd been in therapy for several months beforehand where I told him several times I wanted a divorce. You say it's not a bomb, but you agree with me that he begged you to reconsider. He was very upset and yes, wanted me to reconsider, but. In that phone call, he's begging you to reconsider. Please don't leave. Please don't break up our family, right? He was very upset, yeah. And he was heartbroken. I mean, upset indicates that there was anger. What he was was heartbroken, right? That I decided to divorce him after telling him I would, yes. Despite being at NYU for a presentation, he rushes home, he gets on the next flight, right? So, but she's still participating in these therapy sessions, meaning she hasn't left. So you can say, I'm thinking about a divorce or I, I'm, I'm leaning more towards a divorce, but it's very different waiting till Dan Markell is at a conference in New York and saying, I want a divorce. Interesting that he would meet his future girlfriend, Amy Adler, in New York, where she, in the, I don't know if he'd already known her at this point, but that seemed like a, he was very happy with her at the, sadly, at the end of his life. And what a bombshell, interesting lawyer, uh, law teacher she is and lawyer she is. She, she, her specialty is art. The, the sort of legal ramifications for artists. I honestly don't remember if he got on the next flight, but he did come home quickly. 2.30, he finds out in New York. By 11 p.m., he's walking in the door to your old house at Trescott Drive, right? I don't know. But you do know that when he walks in the house, what he finds. You know that, right? 
Yes, I left him the papers. You left the divorce papers on the bed. Yeah. Right. right? Yes. Half the furniture was gone. Half the furniture was not gone. A good amount of his stuff was gone. Nothing of his was gone. The boys' stuff was gone, right? Some of the boys' things were gone. I'd taken enough so that I had for the boys, but no. You were gone? I, I was gone, yes. And so were his boys. Um, his boys were not gone. He saw them the next day, and they would not have been awake if he's coming home at 11 p.m. Let, let's let's stay on topic here. When he walks in the door, when he walks in the door, the boys are not in the house, right? Correct. And you did not tell Professor Markell where you were taking the boys. He may have seen them the next day, but you did not let him know where you were going to be staying with his boys. With our boys. So you agree with me that they're also his? Of course they're his. And he should be entitled to know where his... Of course they're his. He just can no longer parent them because I unalived him along with my the rest of my family in a, in a murder conspiracy plot. How disgusting. I'm just so turned off by this testimony. But this is the only time where we've really seen Wendy really challenged on these on these points and ask these tough questions. Georgia, I'm sure, is saving it for her trial. His wife is taking his children. Absolutely. That's not all you took, is it? Excuse me? <laughs> you two had a joint checking account at Schwab, right? We did. And you went into that account before you dropped the bomb, and you took out half of that account, right? Correct. Roughly three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Half, yes. Three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I don't remember the amount, but yes. You know that it was in the hundreds of thousands. I really don't remember the amount, sir. Is it that insignificant of a sum to you that you I'm don't not remember? It's an insignificant sum. I'm saying I can't attest to the amount that was there. I'm gonna tell me this. You are unhappy in the marriage, right? That's why I got divorced, yeah. And it happens. Marriages fall apart, right? Yes. But you, you, you complained constantly about it, didn't you? No, I don't think I complained constantly. To anyone that would listen? No, that's not true. You agree with me that you complained to the one person that would actually do something about it? I don't understand what you're asking. Your big brother, Charles Adelson, you complained to him about how bad Professor Markell was and how much you hated him and didn't want to be in a marriage with him. I definitely talked to my brother about how unhappy I was in my marriage. If that's the question, then yes. Let's is that the question? That. Yes, that is a question. You talked to your brother, Charles Adelson, about how bad your marriage was. I did, yes. Let's talk about it. Government asked you about Charles Adelson. He's an intelligent guy, right? He is smart. Yeah. He's both book smart and street smart, right? I would say so. You would say that he's a talker. He does like to talk. He's got the gift of gab, so to speak. I wouldn't say he's the gift of gab, but he does talk. He knows what. Yeah, I would agree with Wendy here. I would say he has the gift of gab, but I don't. Wouldn't I? I, I would say he's a talker, but I wouldn't say he has the gift of gab either. And thank you, Lee Wrighty, for the super chat. Appreciate it. As we've heard in those jailhouse phone calls where he goes over and over and over and over again, the same points. So I wouldn't call it the gift of gab. I'd call it obsessive, <laughs> repetitive, the kind of talking where you'd want to close, put fingers to your fingers to your ears and not listen. That's what I'd call it. What to say in the moment. I wouldn't say that's true either. <laughs> you would say, though, that he is... Now, you, you were asked questions about, you know, drug purchasing and stuff like that. You'd agree with me that, that he's also street smart. I mean, I think he has common sense. And that he lives life to a certain extent on both sides of the track during the day. So do you get what Wendy was doing there? She's saying that Charlie Adelson has common sense, too much common sense to participate in a murder for hire conspiracy plot that killed Dan Markell. That's what that was about, that answer. He's doing 
periodontal work, whatever that is, you know, crowns, root canals, whatever that is. He's doing that during the day. At night, he's out with friends, he's buying drugs, he's living life on both sides of the track. I, I don't know about that, that he's out buying drugs. Now, let's talk for a second about WhatsApp. And as an aside here for a second, the government asked you the question if you used WhatsApp, right? You remember that? I remember them asking me, yes. On the day that Professor Marco was killed, you went in for the interview, right? I talked to the police. And you also gave them your phone for them to inspect. Absolutely. So the determination of what, if any, WhatsApp was being used, they would have from the download they did that day of your phone. Sure. Now, would you be surprised to learn that your brother used WhatsApp? No. You would agree with me that WhatsApp, and you, and you explained it well, is end-to-end -end encryption. Correct. In your, in your lay opinion, if you can explain to the jurors, just in case they don't know, what that means. I don't, I know that it's something we use at my work because essentially it has the ability to keep things more private. I also know that nothing's actually private and that anyone who wants to can uncode the messages. So that's what we tell people at our work. So the thought is with WhatsApp, if, if I use my phone and I call somebody, the call could be listened to, if I text somebody, it's recordable, right? I think so. But with WhatsApp, you can send messages or have phone calls where there's no record of it. I don't think that's true. I think there is still a record of it. But the, 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 the belief in the thought, I'll withdraw that question. Your lay understanding, though, is that the footprint that it leaves is much less than that of normal communications. I think it's different, but I think it still leaves the digital footprint that's usually uncodable. If you were to send a WhatsApp message to Ms. Kaplan, it would show that a message was sent, but it would be hard to get what the content of the message is. I don't think that's true. All right. Let's let's talk about your brother's jokes now. You don't and and we don't know what's on the WhatsApp. According to Wendy, she was when she drove up to the crime scene tape, she was on the phone with her friend from England. If anybody knows anything more about who that was, very long call. She was using WhatsApp, interestingly, but she knows that it's much harder to get back a message that you've erased. And she's already told us she has a habit of erasing a text message that was sent to you on WhatsApp. So she's very sensitive about that issue. And it would be interesting to know if they could retrieve those text messages and if they have retrieved them, what's on them. As we know, the Adelson family did a good job of keeping Wendy out of the trackable conversations. I'm sure she was a part of the conversations at the Adelson house. Remember that after the bump? come over and we'll talk, Donna, come over, right? Come over and we'll talk. We'll talk. We'll talk about it, right? To Charlie. It concerns the two of us, the two of us, just the two of us. Not Wendy. No, 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 not Wendy. Like no 500 times, not Wendy, which is the biggest tip off that it did concern Wendy. And Wendy, I believe, had to be in the know. There's, and I think Charlie Adelson agrees with uh, with me and anyone else who agrees with me, making it us. Don't deny that he joked about hiring a hitman. He did. You don't deny that he repeated this joke. He did. And he made this joke right before a hitman murdered Professor Markell. I don't know that to be true. Okay. He made the joke right before, and I'll leave out the hitman part, Professor Markell was killed. He made the joke the morning that I talked to him. Can you think of one person in this world that would actually hire two, two people to go kill Professor Markell other than your family? Your Honor. Ms. Adelson, please answer. Please address me and answer the question. It calls for an unbelievable amount of speculation. I mean, I'm supposed to, I'm, I'm responsible for coming up with, that's the prosecutor's duty, you know, to figure out who's responsible. You just said a moment ago that you, you disagree that Hitman killed Professor Markell. That, that's what you said, right? So my question to you is, if you're able to say, well, it wasn't Hitman, then who? Tell this jury. Who on this planet would have wanted to kill Professor Markell? I have no idea. All right. 
let's get into that a little bit. But I want, I want to make sure that's clear. This joke is made right before Professor Markell is murdered, right? The joke was made many times. It was made right before Professor Markell was murdered, yes or no? Yes. Right, and, and if you know about the tapes, the jailhouse tapes, there's Charlie and Donna talking about it, saying it's an old joke and everyone's told it. Just doing a poll in of my audience, who in the audience has told that joke maybe with another thing in the place of a television? I bought you this blank because it was cheaper than hiring a hitman. If this joke is so common, just curious if anyone in the audience has told this joke, if it's so common. July 18, 2014, you're interviewed and you make a statement saying, I knew this would happen. You said that, right? I did. All right. Now I want to talk about your knowledge and your belief on this. You're a smart person, right? How am I supposed to answer that? Well, let's go through your resume. You went to Brandeis University, right? I did. You graduated magna cum laude. I did. If you could explain to the jury what that means. It means I studied a lot and got good grades. It means, and to speak, I'm from the Northeast. My Boston accent may give it away. It means you're wicked smart, right? That's very you had a high nice GPA, a very high GPA. I work hard. You also went and you got a master's degree from the University of Cambridge. I did. You were a Gates scholar. I was. You then go to the University of Miami School of Law, which is a, a top tier law school, tier one, right? This is probably the only part of the cross-examination that Wendy's enjoying. Please tell me all my accolades. Please, please tell me more how smart I am, how, how well I did in school, how I graduated summum cum laude or magnum cum laude, whatever she did from Brandeis. She loves it. Look at her face. Does that look like someone that's embarrassed? Okay. <laughs> Right? We're talking about your level of intelligence. You went to the University of Miami Law School, right? I did, yes. You also clerked at the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, right? I did. Now, to get a clerkship out of law school, it's a very difficult thing to do, right? It's challenging. You have to have top grades. You have to go through a rigorous selection process, right? Yes. You then become a, a, a professor at the, the, the Florida State University College of Law, right? You're also a published author, right? Now you're just embarrassing me. Why, why are you embarrassed that you're a published author? I just, I don't like talking about myself. Is it because? Right, because Wendy, who doesn't like talking about herself, made a podcast and wrote a book with a character strangely like Wendy, Lily. And it was so funny, we were going over what her new last name should be last night. And the suggestions were making me cry. Someone suggested Lily Stone, which was her character's name in the book. Other people were saying Wendy Lias, <laughs> Liathan, Lionstein, Lyingberg. Thank you very much, Eric Frazier, for the super chat. I appreciate it so much. And the poll seems to be not one person in my audience, not a scientific poll, has ever made that joke. Doesn't mean it's impossible that it's a coincidence, but certainly it is not the common occurrence that Donna and Charlie would like you to believe it is, that people are just telling that old hackney hitman joke left and right nowadays. Is the book that you wrote discredited Tallahassee and spoke ill of it? <laughs> the book did not discredit Tallahassee. It wasn't about Tallahassee. Let's stay on topic and ask a question again with everything that we just went through. You're a smart woman, right? I am a smart woman. There's information about this case everywhere. You'd agree with me on that, right? I've been advised by my lawyer not to read it. All right. Now, we're not talking about reading stuff. There's podcasts. Also not to listen. TV shows. Also not to watch. Articles. Don't read. And so 
you've made the decision. Now, you're a lawyer yourself too, right? I am. And you made the decision. I'm not going to look at any of this stuff. Correct. I don't want to know what happened to the father of my two children. Not I don't want to know what happened. How can you say you love those boys if you don't care who killed the father that they loved? Of course I care who killed the father that they loved. Then why won't you look at the stuff? I've been advised not to. Are you afraid that when you look at it, you're going to realize that your brother did this? I am not afraid of that. Now, of course, you, you, you and we won't get into privileged communications, but you've spoken to your lawyer about the case. How are we not getting into privileged communications? Yes, I've spoken to my lawyer about the case. You're very intelligent. You have one of the top defense attorneys in the country, former federal prosecutor, John Law, right there in the blue suit, right? He is my attorney. You're telling me with all of this at your disposal, your intelligence, his experience, and all this information, that you don't care to find out who it is that killed Professor Markell? This is not that I don't care to find out. My job is to take care of those boys, and that is what I do. I don't see how it helps take care of them to go reading and watching and soaking up all of the horrible information that's out there. You don't realize that you could be helped. See, it's not about you, Wendy. It's about your sons knowing who killed their father, and it's also about the Markell family. It's not all about you, Wendy, and what will help you. And really, her lawyer advised her because she has nothing to do with any of this conspiracy, not to look at anything. Really? Really? You, you, th you think he really advised her not to read the paper or listen to a podcast on the case? Maybe now that she's a witness, I can see that. But seriously? Seriously? Is that what her lawyer advised when they called Craig Isom and were like, sorry, the whole Adelson family isn't going to talk. We're on our way to Miami and good luck with your investigation. We're not going to help you with it. You think that's what she would want for her family? If her, if Donna were, were murdered in this way or Charlie or herself, she'd want that. If it were the other way around, she'd want Dan Markell to say, travel to Canada and never talk for six hours with the police, and then travel to Canada and never talk to them again. That's what she wants us to believe that that's, she would understand that. Take your two boys, go to Canada, never talk to them again. It's so absurd and finally untangling this to give this jury the truth about what happened to Professor Markell? I have been nothing but helpful since this started. So what happened to their son? By you looking at it, you are at the center of all this, but you won't look at anything to help in the process. I've done nothing but help in this process. You came here and testified. I came here and testified. I spoke you to the police to for six hours without anyone present. I signed over my cell phone, my car, my house everything, my computer, what else do I have or know that you haven't seen? You came here because you were subpoenaed and had no choice. Correct. Right? This is not fun. You've I would been, not do this by choice. You've been inconvenienced. I've not been inconvenienced. Professor Markell was shot in the head. I'm not complaining about being here. This is my duty. I'm here. We'll get back to you complaining about being here. Do you honestly expect this jury to believe that you haven't confronted your brother about all of this? Yes, I do. Yes, you did confront them? Yes, I do expect them to believe that I did not confront my brother because I didn't. Well, maybe you don't need to because you know the truth in this case. You already know it. That he went behind your back, right? Did not happen. Just like he has done with past boyfriends. He's done that in the past where he's gone behind your back when you were having problems in a relationship and dealt with it himself. No. Ms. Adelson, you understand that until you expose your brother what he did, that everybody's going to consider you as guilty. You understand that, right? What is the question that you're asking me? You understand that until you expose your brother and explain what he did, that he went behind everybody's back, that he hired a hitman to murder your ex-husband, you'll remain guilty in the eyes of the world. 
I can't speak to the eyes of the world. I can only know that I have done nothing wrong. Well, maybe you are guilty. I am not guilty. So a witness in this case, and I'm not going to get into their testimony, but one of the hitmen, the convicted hitman, implicates you. On July 17, 2014, the day before the murder, the morning before, he says that you were walking on Trescott with the two boys, that you walked down the driveway and into the house. That never happened. Right, because Dan, Professor Markell, I apologize, Professor Markell, he had the kids. Based on the way that your guy's schedule was, on that day, he would have had the children in the morning, and you're going through such a bad divorce, you wouldn't be at his house, right? I wouldn't be at his house anyway, but not because we weren't we were going through a bad divorce. At that time, things were pretty copacetic. All right, so we're coming back to maybe you do know, or maybe you were involved. Excuse me? What's I, the I, question that you're asking me? I'm giving you a header of what we're talking about so that it will ease you in the question, okay? I'm just telling you what the topic that we're on, so we'll get to a question. Now, the government asked you about a time that you met Ms. Magbano. It was actually spring break of March 2014, right? I believe so. You went down to Miami. You stayed with your brother, Charles. I went down to Fort Lauderdale after being in Immokalee and well, stayed with my brother. You then went to Miami, Miami Beach to Yardbird and had dinner outside with your boyfriend at the time or who you were dating, Jeffrey Lacoste. Captain McBannell was there and your brother, Charles Adelson, and you all laid outside, right? We did. And that's on Miami Beach, not in Fort Lauderdale. Correct. Now, just for context, Jeffrey Lacoste, he was also an FSU professor, not at the law school, but an FSU professor. Nice guy, right? <laughs> I don't think so now. <laughs> no. Yeah, now the whole family seems to dislike Jeffrey Lacoste. Remember Wendy... Uh, Wendy, Donna, I always do that. Donna called him red and shifty and totally unbelievable. He was lying. He was lying up there on the stand to Charlie. You guys remember that? So I think Jeffrey Lacoste has now replaced Dan Markell as the new villain, one of their new villains out there to get the Adelson family. But I love how Wendy will always say, what's the question? Because she knows that she has to be asked a question. Like she's correcting his lawyering, DeCoste's lawyering. That's the lawyer, Katie McBanawa's lawyer, who's doing this cross-examination brilliantly, I think. Really well done. You deny, I'm assuming, that on July... 13, 2014, you told Jeffrey Lacoste that Charles looked into hiring a hitman. You deny that or you admit that? I deny that. And <clears throat> that you told him that Charles looked into hiring a hitman back in September of 2013. That never happened. Which would have been months before your brother even met Catherine McBannon. I don't remember when they met. Letting you know the topic we're on, we're talking about you being involved. That same week, earlier in the week, you sent an email. We're talking about the week of the murder now, not spring break, the week of the murder, not yard bird, the week of the murder. You sent an email to Jeffrey Lacoste saying that you wanted to break up, that you needed space, right? I did. Sent him a long email, stay away, we're broken up, right? I did. You knew that on July 18, 2014, Jeffrey Lacoste was leaving town to go on a trip, right? I knew he was leaving at some point that week. I don't remember when. You knew that he was leaving on the same day of the murder at the same exact time as the murder. I don't think I did. 11 a.m. on July 18, 2014. I don't think I knew when he was leaving town. Yeah, I just thought he was taking some kind of vacation style thing. I didn't know it was a trip and I didn't know it was out of town. Here, I'm going to answer like Wendy. <laughs> That's what I do. It was just some kind of maybe a drive that was sort of like could be construed as a trip, but more like a vacation style type thing. I, I didn't know he was actually taking a trip. Okay, Wendy. 
it's a good way to put the blame onto somebody else. You'd agree on that, right? I if agree. if it happened, it would have been a good way to put the blame on somebody else. I have no idea when he was going to leave town. Your interview, July 18, 2014, you, you, you said, you know, my brother, he, he joked about hiring a hitman. Perhaps that was you just planting a seed to divert the attention of law enforcement away from you. It was not. Let's jump off topic right now and talk about your boys' names. That in the time after the murder, you changed their last names from Markel, Markel to Adelson, right? A year later, yes. Why? I was scared. Of what? Of someone coming to attack them. So it's a year later, you won't look at anything because you don't want to know what's going on in the case. But she's clearly not scared that anyone's going to attack her because there she is in the footage I just showed you giving a speech about her book and answering questions. She's not in a mask, fully using her own name out there even alluding to a family situation. She seems to have no fear giving that speech, but she's afraid enough for her boys that someone that killed uh, her ex-husband in his driveway is going to go after two little kids next. It's so absurd. And the thought is, well, they're going to be protected if they have my last name and not Markel, right? Yes. Now, years later, arrests are made. It's clear who committed the murder, Secreto Garcia Luis Rivera. The Adelson name has been dragged through the mud. Why haven't you continued to protect your boys and changed the name back? I will be changing. The, I'm not going to change the name back. I don't think that will help. One day I'll change all of our names. The government asked you about immunity, so let's. One day I'll change all of our names, and I w and we will all go off into the sunset into a non extradition country just like my mother tried to do one day, right? One day when I think law, the hands of the law are getting close, I will change all of our names and we will disappear like Hannibal Lecter into the crowd with a new name change. Let's get into that. You, you, you explained that as an attorney, you understand that when the government gives a subpoena for somebody to testify that it conveys immunity, right? That's my understanding. My knowledge of criminal law dates back to 2003 when I took a semester in law school. So forgive me. Graduated law school, right? This isn't my area of law. When you, when you clerked on the 11th circuit, it was with Judge Jordan, right? I did immigration appeals. Yeah, but you still dealt with criminal stuff as well, too. Very little. So... Your understanding, though, is it doesn't mean they can't arrest you. They just can't use what you say here against you later on. So you're protected. Correct. And you needed that to testify, right? It's just given to testify. It's not a question of whether I needed it. It comes with testifying. You fear being charged by them. So you need to have that protection of I your words. I don't fear being charged for a crime I didn't commit, no. Now, you all had this nice exchange where it was pleasant, but there's actually... So is this going to change now that Donna has been indicted and Charlie's been, quote unquote, wrongfully convicted? That's the line of this family. Is she going to now say that she's fearful of being wrongfully convicted? That's what I'd like to know. And what I was saying last night is my biggest fear is I'm not sure which it is, it, whether it's that this case ends with Donna and Wendy never gets indicted, and the person that benefits the most from this crime just wa walks off, waltzes off into the sunset, or if it's that Wendy will get indicted, tried, and convicted, and that she will somehow, with her great lawyers, reverse her conviction get out and then go on a media tour where everyone will treat her like a victim. And you know, she'll love that. And she can talk all about her wrongful conviction on all these channels that I think that is much more of a greater fear.
this office, right? No. They recently had your brother, Charles Adelson, arrested, and he's in custody, right? Correct. For first degree murder. Correct. And there's no tension? It's very uncomfortable to be here. It's hard to tell where the tension is coming from. They've discussed your involvement in this case. They insinuated on the direct examination. There's no tension? Lots of media insinuates that I did something I didn't do, too. I can't feel tension towards every person in the world. That's funny. I thought you didn't look at anything. I don't. That's why. But you know that, that the, the, you know about the media, but you don't know about the media? I know about the media because it keeps me from, from employment. It keeps me from lots of things in my life. I'm aware of what's there, but I don't, I don't read the minutia so I can sleep at night. I mean, having a godmother who's an actress who publicly says she doesn't read her reviews. Well, she has them read to her. They know. These people know. She's read the stuff. She's looked at it. She knows what's out there. It's not like she gets a job rejection and they're like, oh, you're the Wendy Adelson who's mixed up in that murder for hire conspiracy down in Tallahassee, up in Tallahassee. I don't think so. You think it really works out like that? Is that what she's trying to tell us? Kat Giselle, thank you so much. Roberta, love your coverage and hilarious AF jabs at these awful people. Oh, thank you. I'm sure Wendy figured out a way to blame Tallahassee for her frizzy hair. I think Sunny Tanner said in my interview that she forgot her hair straightener this day. I don't know what happened. I was talking about it today with Murder by Maestro. And he was saying that he just wondered if she's not a total mess and that she just dresses in these outfits because it's easy. And really presenting herself well is a challenge for her. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I, my theory is that she, dress in, she dresses in this dress for testimony so people can't tell how many times she's testified and won't watch every single piece of coverage. They'll think they've seen it. But the hair, you're right, Kat, the hair gives it away. Adelson, five minutes ago, you said you don't look at any of that stuff. Now I, I ask you a question. It. Let me finish. Sure. Five minutes ago, you say you don't look at any of that stuff. Now I ask you a question. You say you look at stuff. That's not actually what I said. I said, I'm aware that it exists, but I don't read it. I don't listen to it. Then I, how do you know that they're bashing you? You just told me they are. I did? Yeah. How about this? We'll come back to it. You can think up a better answer, okay? I'm not thinking up an answer. I'm telling you the truth. I'm sorry if you don't want to listen to it. Your basic understanding of criminal law, though, you know that if the defense gives you a subpoena, you get no immunity. Correction, improper question. I'm not going beyond that question. All right. That's the only question you can ask on that. If I give you a subpoena, you don't get immunity, right? Correct. Let's talk about your parents. The government asked you about your... your so my understanding is why they gave her this immunity is because she threatened to take the fifth every single question. And so what these Castigar issues have to do with is that she can't end up in a worse situation testifying than had she gone up there and taken the fifth. So I hope that clears that up for people. So the government, I mean, the state, I'm sorry, the state can't investigate from her testimony using her testimony as a starting off point. So her testimony, anything that she says can't be used to investigate or can't be used against her. Matt Schneider, thank you so much. <laughs> I love Roberta. If anyone messes with her, I'm going to sue them. Oh, excellent. <laughs> excellent. Does that... Does that cover people who make their videos private at the end of my live streams? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Can I sue them for making it private? Actually, I'm so disappointed that Mentor Lawyer hasn't done a video with a snarky title <laughs> about my channel like he did with Gigi of Pretty, Li Pretty Lies and Alibis, that channel when she put up all those excellent, wonderfully polished audio versions of the 
calls. You know, she really improved the audio and put them up as videos on YouTube. I hope that's not too confusing. Long way round on that. Mother and father, Donna and Harvey, right? The government could do the same and subpoena them so that this jury can watch them get questioned, not nicely how Ms. Kaplan questioned you, but to be cross-examined by me. Objection, improper question. I, I'm going to sustain that. Ask a different question. Are your parents here in Tallahassee right now? No. Are they back in Miami? Yes. Do they have any plans of coming here this week or next? I don't think so. Your family dynamic, it is your mother and father, Harvey and Donna. There's you, you're the youngest, Charles, and then the oldest, Robert, right? Correct. And he's a doctor up in New York. Correct. Now, the government asked you about the relationship, <coughs> and you're like, we don't talk much. It's actually much deeper than that with Robert, isn't it? We don't talk. At all. At all. And the reason is, is because your parents were so difficult about the woman that is now his wife. That is not the reason why we don't talk. I'm not talking about the reason why you don't talk. Let me clarify the reason why your parents don't talk to him. That's not the reason why they don't talk to him. Are you saying to this jury that there wasn't a problem where they outright objected to his marriage of a woman that was not of the Jewish faith? That was initially what happened. And they found out that she was Jewish style. And then we say, then we accepted her. She was Jewish style to cost. <laughs> Then the whole family accepted her. Then we were one busy, we were one happy family. And then Robert somehow decided to go off on his own. That's what happened. Somehow, after finding out that we might have had a little something to do with this murder conspiracy, just a little bit, just a little, just a little bit. And then there was actually a beautiful reconciliation, and they're very happy about the marriage. Robert and his wife, not your family. Robert and his wife and our family were very happy about Robert's marriage. So what happens is, is that Robert is in love with a woman. Your parents object. He breaks up with her and then dates a Jewish woman, right? And then they got married and divorced. And then he got back together with the person he wanted to be married to. Yes. With his true love. Yes. And we were all very verklempt at the, at the ceremony. It was wonderful. I don't know what went wrong with that. We had a wonderful relationship until my eldest, for some reason, for some some strange reason, didn't want to talk, didn't want to talk to the rest of the family after he found out they were all killers. Strangely, didn't want to celebrate holidays with them. <laughs> isn't that isn't that wild? Didn't want to be near them. And strangely, Robert was really interested in who killed Dan Markell. But there was a lot of tension in your family because of your family's involvement in the kids' marriages, right? Yes. Let's talk briefly about your, your children. The government had asked you in the, the topic of the Jewish faith, keeping kosher. Uh, you mentioned a bat mitzvah at one point in time. You're currently planning a bat mitzvah for your oldest, right? No, it already happened. Okay. Now, that is a very... Now, I'm Christopher, I'm obviously not Jewish, but my understanding is, is that it is a very, very important thing in the Jewish faith. It's a very important milestone. And for those that are very conservative in the Jewish faith, those that keep kosher, so to speak, it's even bigger. I don't know that it's more important to... It's, it's a, a bar mitzvah style celebration that we're having for him. <laughs> We had a bar mitzvah. A, is it a bat mitzvah or a bar mitzvah? I want to say bar mitzvah. For am I wrong? Is that for a woman, a girl, becoming a woman? Bar mitzvah and it's bat mitzvah for a man. I thought it was the other way around, but I, I of course was born Jewish, but raised Quaker, or born three quarters Jewish. My mother's only half Jewish, so there's a lot of Jews who say I don't even cut it that way either, but. Just so curious. Hold on. Let me check. Let me confer. Are there bot bar for a boy? Yeah, that's what I thought. And he said bot. I thought he just said bot. Yeah, it was a bar mitzvah style celebration. Obviously, where we 
totally disinvited the Markells because Charlie got arrested. That was a little that was a little problem that he got right arrested right before the bar mitzvah. And we had to uninvite Ruth, uh, Ruth Markell and her, and her former husband. Oh my gosh. It's craziness. One segment of Judaism over another, but it's, it's an important coming of age ceremony. Phil Markell, excuse me, Phil Markell. It's where a boy becomes a man. Did you invite Dan Markell's parents, the kid's grandparents? I did. You invited them? I invited them, yeah. When was the last time they saw face-to-face -to -face their grandchildren? April 20th. It was like, it was invitation style. It's the kind of invitation where we send it and then we resend it. And so it's sort of like an invitation, but it's not. That's what, we gave them an invitation style to the bar mitzvah style celebration. That's what we did. <laughs> so silly she's so ridiculous uh we the people are there moderators in this chat i need someone to moderate roberta's donna voice i'm running out of dry pants okay oh thanks thank you we the people yeah there are some real haters out there of the whole donna <laughs> imitation but once you start it's hard to stop Maybe I'll need an intervention by the end of this, covering this case. Of this year? Just now. And you agree with me that it had been years since 2000. Thank you very much, we the people. 2016 since the last. And you agree with their grandchildren? April 20th. Of this year? Just now. And you agree with me that it had been years since 2016 since the last time they had seen them? The visit stopped when they threatened to put my children in foster care, yes. But up until that point, they did have visits. She had no problem letting them see your brother Charles, right? I'm sorry? You have no problem letting them hang out with your, your brother Charles, who's now sitting in custody for first-degree murder. Oh, they can't see him now, can they? No, they can't, but I'll ask. But we know that they were still in touch. At least the eldest boy was still in touch with Charlie, if I'm remembering right from the jail house calls. So that's a really telling point that she wants the Markells to have nothing to do with her children or their grandchildren, but she's perfectly happy having Charlie and Donna around them all the time who have subsequently both been arrested for this. And you could say that she didn't know, but I'm going to make this point one more time. I know you're probably so sick of hearing of this, but you have to think that if she didn't know that the family was totally okay with Wendy turning around after the deed was done, after Dan Markell was killed and they spent over a hundred thousand dollars getting this thing done, turning around and saying, Oh, that's not what I wanted. Sure. I was going through all this trouble. Sure. I had all these, angry feelings for him, but I didn't want this. And there goes that relationship and there goes any kind of relationship with the grandkids. So it doesn't seem too likely to me. And also you have to think that she would just would have driven by the crime scene by accident, right at that time, right after it was done. Almost like someone who was checking to see if the hit was done, like someone who couldn't help themselves who like to flirt with danger. Ask the questions. For years, they weren't able to see their grandchildren despite their pleading to you to see them, but you let them, let me finish, but you let them hang out with your murdering brother, right? The children were permitted to see their grandparents. I cooked for them. We had play dates. They had sleepovers. When a letter surfaced that they were trying to have my children placed in foster care, the visits stopped. My brother never threatened to put my children in foster care. And if he had, the visits would have stopped with him too. You say you love your boys. So, I do. so what Ruth Markell was doing was trying to make an arrangement for a certain, for a certain foster service to hold on to the boys till they could get from Canada the few hours, probably they would have hopped on the first plane to come get them, should had Wendy in the event of Wendy's arrest 
And so they could take care of them. That's what that was about. But it was a great excuse for Wendy to say to the jury, oh, the only reason I cut them off is because they were threatening to put my kids into foster care and I would have done that for my brother. I do say I love my children. Don't care about the father that they love. I never said that I don't care about the father that they love. Then look at some of the discovery and help figure it out. Excuse me? Then look at some of the evidence and help figure it out so that more lives aren't ruined by this. I I seem to not understand. You need to ask a question now. You're making statements now. You need to ask a question. Understood, Your Honor. If I could have one brief second to check with Joe Kennedy. So that's a little trick that lawyers do when they want the jury to pay attention to something. The jury's probably supposed to disregard that last statement to Wendy, then help law enforcement, then don't call law enforcement right after Dan Markell's memorial service via your lawyer. Have your lawyer call law enforcement and say, sorry, I have the Adelson family here. They're my clients. They're not going to talk. But it's already... It's already out there. It's hard to disregard statements like that. And of course, at the end of this devastating cross, she looks so guilty already. It really is just the cherry on top of the cake. Ms. Adelson, we started this by saying that this this is all about you. It, it started with you because of this marriage, right? No. Well, you had tried to say that, but I don't agree. Ms. Adelson, I, I, I'm going to make one final attempt through questions to implore you. You understand that you can't protect your brother Charles, who's going through this case, and protect yourself at the same time. You understand that, right? I'm here to share the truth with you. I don't know how to answer the question. Then please end the madness and share the truth. Will you please share the truth with this jury? I've been sharing the truth since I walked in here. I've done nothing but share the truth. Very much like how Charlie Adelson answered these questions when he got in a, got stuck. I was going to say in a rut when he got stuck, he would say, but that's the truth. I know it sounds weird that the Latin Kings put me on a payment plan, but that's what happened to me. These Latin kings were into steady income. That's what they wanted. Steady $3,000 check every month. And that's what I gave them. They weren't interested in my Ferrari and all the other expensive things that I own. That's what happened to me. That's the truth. And she's going for the same, same kind of answer here. You know what happened here, despite your claims to the jury that you haven't looked at anything, you haven't discussed with anybody, and you haven't confronted your brother. You know what happened here, right? I do not know what happened here. And if I did, I would have shared it with the police eight years ago. You know that your brother, you know that your brother went behind your back, don't you? I do not. Like he always does. This is something that he has always done, isn't it? (laughs) You found out after that your brother had done this and gone behind your back. That's why you were thrown up at that dinner, right? No, it's not. You know that it didn't involve Katie either, right? I don't know anything about it. If you're not going to say all of that and finally give the truth, why don't you just admit to this jury that you're guilty? Because I'm not guilty. One brief moment. Is that the head shaking that you guys were talking about? In that line of questioning where she's shaking her head now? Right here? I think it was in Georgia's direct you were talking about. I have to go back and look at that again. You know that it didn't involve Katie either, right? I don't know anything about if you're, if you're not going to say all of that and finally give the truth, why don't you just admit to this jury that you're guilty? Because I'm not guilty. One brief moment. I 
Okay, Redirect. Redirect. You were asked about the reason why you stopped contact for a period of time between your ex-husband's parents and your children. Yes. And you referenced a letter that in, you characterized as the grandparents threatening to put the children in foster care. Is that a, an email that was sent from those, the Markels, to my office? Yes. Okay. And that was in reference to, in the event that you and the people that care for these children, who at the time were very young, were arrested, that the grandparents wanted to make sure, because they live in Canada, right? They do. They wanted to make sure that a specific organization could be contacted to care for the children so that someone was there to care for them until a relative could get there. I don't right? remember the bit about a relative getting there. Okay, well, they weren't just going to leave them in foster care, right? I don't know. Okay. But the, the specific nature of the email, you will agree, was in the event that there's some kind of mass arrest, because they don't know who's getting ready to go to jail next, right? I mean, they're not privy to the investigation any more than you are, right? Law enforcement investigations, they're secret. Sure. Okay, and their concern, would you agree the concern ultimately in the email was for the care of the children? The concern was to make sure the children were under good care, but as their mothers, I know they're always under good care with me. Right, but and there's no the need email for foster care. contemplated you not being available to care for them. That's not possible. Because it's not possible for you to get arrested. Correct, because I've done nothing wrong and I believe in our justice system. Okay, well... Just wanted to clarify the nature of that. In this wow, what do you think Georgia was going to say there? Did you hear that? The, the little well? Well, get ready for a surprise. Get ready. Well, might not work out the way you think. That's what it sounded like she was going to say. Listen, listen again. Do you get arrested? Correct. Because I've done nothing wrong and I believe in our justice system. Okay. Well, just wanted to clarify the nature of that. In this case, you were asked about, you know, why aren't your parents coming to testify? You, as you mentioned, gave a police interview in this case, right? Correct. And consented to the search of your phone, etc. You gave testimony in this case, right? Yes. All right. And your parents did not, correct? They did not give testimony. They have not testified. They, they have, have not given a to police to come testify, but they would if they were asked. Hmm, okay. And have they given any police interviews? They would have, but the police never contacted them. The police did contact them, didn't they? And they refused. No. Are they represented by counsel? They are represented by counsel. And they're, they'll come testify if they wanted to. If they are under state subpoena, just like I was, they would come testify. All right. And do you know what they would testify? I mean, if they're forced to testify via subpoena, they'll come. That's how helpful they are. <laughs> so ridiculous they didn't it's just law enforcement never asked they never wanted to ask the the only people in the world who disliked dan markell enough to kill him the only people the police would see as a threat to dan markell they police didn't have any interest in talking to them right that's why the lawyer contacted the detective right after dan markell's memorial service Massive, massive lies here. Testify to? They would testify to whatever they know. Um, um, do you know what they know? I have no idea what they know. Okay. They've never told you? No. You've never asked them? No. Because you've never had any conversations with them about this murder? I've been advised by my counsel not to. All right. So nobody, including your brother Charlie, has admitted or denied to you any involvement in the murder one way or the other? Correct. Same with your parents? Correct. One moment, please, Your Honor. Okay. Okay, so just this is the end of it. Watch Wendy walk out, walk out the door. So delighted that it's over. Nothing further, Your Honor. You want her subject to recall? Uh, no, sir. She's free to go by the business. All right, you're free to go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Not for nothing, but does anyone know where that dress is from? All right. Um, let's put uh, Miss Rodriguez back on the stage.
the now iconic gray dress. Does anyone know who makes that? Because I think Judy from AA Legal Focus needs to complete her wardrobe now that she has the Donna top, the Donna shorts, the Donna glasses. Now she needs the Wendy dress and she needs to give us a sketch. She doesn't already, unless she miss, unless she's done it already and I've missed it. Okay. I'm going to take a, actually, you know what? I just have one last thing to show you guys. This is from October 22nd, 2023 from Charlie Adelson's trial. This is a victim impact statement. Dear Judge Wheeler, we attended Harvard Law School with Dan Markell over 20 years ago. And if it were not for him, we might not have gotten married to each other. He brought us back together after we had split apart and we have stayed together ever since now blessed with two children. Excuse me. Bringing people together was only one of Dan's many mitzvahs, good deeds, as we are sure you will be reading about from our friends, family, and colleagues. He regularly called and emailed us and took the time to visit us in person. And even after we moved across country to California, Oh, to California, his murder was shocking and something we still think about a lot. Even after so many years, he was a most memorable schoolmate and loving friend and the least deserving of a deliberate, calculated death. Below are pictures of the three of us celebrating Ted's 26th birthday during law school in the fall of 2000 when Ted was joking about turning 62 instead of 26. Dan will never enjoy another birthday. In fact, last year, he also missed his eldest son's Benjamin's, Benjamin's bar mitzvah, a major religious and cultural milestone that would have meant so much to him. As we celebrated our own child's bat mitzvah last year, we thought to ourselves, Dan would have loved to celebrate our milestone with us too. And so it's really hard to see, but here are some pictures that were Xeroxed and put into the record. An additional note from Giselle. I was newly pregnant with our second child when I heard the news of Dan's death in July of 2014, it hit me so hard that I was shaking and sobbing off and on for months. I grieved privately so that our older child, then age five, born within months of Dan and Wendy's older son, Benjamin, would not see me crying because I knew that I couldn't even begin to explain what had happened. How do you explain a murder like this to a five-year-old? I would hide and cry. Uh, hide. Sorry, excuse me. I would hide and cry, hide and cry. I try not to think about it. Then it would come back and hit me. I sometimes worried that the intense grief would cause a miscarriage. I was terribly sick with nausea during the pregnancy. And to this day, Whenever I think about Dan's death, I am hit by the same waves of nausea. We will never have Dan's loving smile, smiling face back. So all we can hope for now is justice. Sincerely, Giselle and Ted Chandler. That's what I have for today. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back Saturday. So I live stream every day except Tuesdays and Fridays. And I'll see you back here Saturday at 6 p.m. Eastern, same time every day. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the 
thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, share this episode, leave me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Have a great night, everybody.